Thank you very much. Um, I call this meeting to order the Boise School District uh, Board of Trustees for the December meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, before we start, I would like to remind everybody, everyone, that we conduct our meetings according to district values of respect, dignity, honesty, responsibility, and teamwork. In keeping with those values, here are the rules for our board meetings. First, out of respect to all of our patients, trustees, and staff, interruptions to our business will not be tolerated. Any person who tries to disrupt this meeting will be given one warning. If there is a second disruption, that person or persons will be asked to leave. The meeting will not continue until the persons or person has left the room. Second, our district is currently mandating that masks be worn in our buildings. Please wear masks during your time in our building. Similar disruptions, you will be given one warning to replace your mask. If there is a second incident, that person or persons will be asked to leave. The meeting will not continue until the person or persons has left the room. Third, if you have input you would like to share with the board, please submit it in an email. Our email address can be found on the district website. I assure you that every member of this board reads the emails that we receive. Thank you for supporting these board rules. Uh, with that, we will go ahead and go forward to the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. And I believe we have Mrs. Boyer's sixth grade class from Morley Melson on video. Just one second, we're having, having a audio. So thank you to Mrs. Boyer's sixth grade class from Morley Nelson. That was great. Good to hear the kids again. Um, with that, we will move forward um, with a great fun new thing. We get to install a new trustee tonight. So Steve Schmidt, if you will come forward to the podium and then Clerk Mass, I believe you will administer the oath. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution and the laws of this state. And the Constitution and the laws of this state. And the Boise School District Board Commitment and Code of Ethics. And the Boise School District Board Commitment and Code of Ethics. That I will promote the interests of education that I will promote the interests of education and faithfully perform all the duties and faithfully perform all the duties of the office of trustee of the independent school district of Boise City of the office of trustee of the Boise Independent School District of Boise City a specially chartered school district of the state of Idaho a specially chartered school district of the state of Idaho according to the best of my ability according to the best of my abilities you may take your seat on the board Well, welcome, Trustee Schmidt. Uh, we look forward to serving with you. And with that, we will move on to the red and gold Apple Video Award presentations. It is our pleasure to recognize an individual who has served the children and the families of the Boise School District for four years. This person is the heart and soul of Riverside Elementary School. This person is flexible, positive, exudes love and professionalism, and will do anything in her power to support students and staff. There isn't a student at Riverside who does not interact with her each day. She supervises on the playground and in the lunchroom, assists in the library, serves in the health room, and facilitates small group instruction for students. She does all of this with a calm, 
friendly, and caring demeanor. This person takes the lead with all school support personnel and regularly assists with scheduling, communication, and coaching new team members. She is a re ready problem solver and always brings solutions when discussing challenges. This person continually brings the needs of students first. She loves her job and has repeatedly declined promotions or position changes that would limit her interactions with students, stating, I love my job and want to be around our students. Recently, Riverside students were asked to identify adults at school with whom they would feel comfortable sharing personal, academic, or social problems. At every grade level, this person's name was at the top of the list. She was identified as a friend and confident by dozens of students. Riverside would not be the same without her. It is our distinct honor to present the Golden Apple Award for December 13th, 2021 to Connie Finn, School Support Assistant, Riverside Elementary School, for outstanding service to education and for educating today for a better tomorrow. Connie, come on over and get your award. Thank you very much. Here are the words and the certificate, Thank you. and we'll give you a chance to say a few words. Um, I just want to say that I'm touched. My heart is completely touched by this. I love my job, and it's because I'm surrounded by incredible people who um, do wonderful, selfless things every day. And we all do it for our kids, our students, our beautiful children who um, fill our hearts and souls. So as far as I'm concerned, this award belongs to all of Riverside. So congratulations, Riverside. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. It is our distinct honor to recognize an individual who has served the children of the Boise School District for eight years. This person has had three major careers in his life, but in his midlife, he decided to make a huge change so that he could make a difference in the future generation. This person works diligently every day to do so. Engaging students is important to this individual. He is thoughtful about the content that he teaches and makes learning accessible to all of his students. He encourages teamwork and cooperation with his students and takes special care to invite in speakers and make learning, learning meaningful. He positively impacts the lives and learning of children. Communication with parents is important to this person. He has his own website and a newsletter that he sends out weekly. He is passionate about keeping parents involved in students' learning and keeping students accountable with the help of the adults in their lives. He is a supporter of public schools and he motivates others on the education team to do their very best in meeting the academic and social needs of each and every student. Teaching students citizenship, responsibility, and ethics is also a passion for this person. He reorganized the safety patrol where he teaches students to accept responsibility, enforce rules, be dependable, show good judgment, and respect classmates. Students are well-trained, visible, and taught how to interact with others. This person is a true education professional who demonstrates an unwavering commitment to the Boise School District and the students we serve. He shows strong leadership by setting high standards for himself and students. In short, his public education career can best be described as one marked by integrity, service above self, and a dedication to the students of the Boise School District. It is our distinct honor to present the Red Apple Award for December 13th, 2021 to Darwood Ashmead, fifth grade teacher, Grace Jordan Elementary, for outstanding service to education and for educating today for a better tomorrow. Congratulations, Darwood. <laughs> All right, here is your, your award, and these are the words that were written about you for you to keep. And now it's your opportunity to say some words to your colleagues. Well, uh, thank you so much for this award. Um, when I heard that I was going to get this award, I wasn't sure I heard right, because the only awards I usually get are participation awards. <laughs> 
So um, there's a lot of people more deserving of this award than I am in the Boise School District, but I am so honored that you guys chose me to get this award. There's a lot of people I'd like to thank for this award. Um, early on in my career, I had a couple of mentor teachers that worked across the hall from me, and they taught me so much about what it means to be a teacher and how to engage the students and how to teach the students in a caring and loving way. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank um, <clears throat> all of you, uh, my partner teacher, uh, everybody in the school, you all have encouraged me in one way or another, whether it's a small way or a large way, but you've all encouraged me the way I see you walking down the hall with your students, the way I see you talking to your students in your classrooms, everything you do has encouraged me to be a better teacher and a better person. So I thank you all for that too. I also want to thank the administration here for always supporting me and having my back. Um, and especially for giving me those little words of encouragement when I need it the most. Finally, I'd like to um, thank the students here at Grace Jordan. We've got a great bunch of students here um, and they roar often. They, <laughs> they respect each other, they own their actions, they act safely and they rise to the challenge every day. So I'd like to thank the students for that. I think we're all here for about the same reason. We wanna make productive members of society and we want the students to become the best people, the best grown-ups they can be. And that's our goals. And we do that every day here at Grace Jordan through teaching the kids leadership skills, how to be good leaders in their classroom, how to be good leaders in the school, how to be good leaders in their community. We do that through the Everyday Leadership Program. We do that through Safety Patrol Program. We do that through lessons we teach in the classroom, counselor lessons. We're teaching it every day along with all the other curriculum that we do. So really this award isn't just for me, it's a reflection of how you guys have taught me to be a better teacher. And so this award was really for all of us, but I'll hold on to it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I always love the Red and Gold Apple Awards. Um, congratulations to Connie and Darwood. Uh, you're part of what helps make our school district great. We appreciate everything that you do every day. Um, we will go ahead and move on next to the Holloway, ho holiday, holiday card recognition. And I'm not sure who's, uh, is that gonna be a video presentation as well? Okay, thank you. It is our distinct honor to recognize the creator of this year's district's winner of the Boise School District Winter Card Art Contest. The Winter Card Art Contest is normally held in conjunction with Festivals of Trees, but because that was canceled, the district still decided to do this contest because it's so appreciated by all of the students. This fun and festive art contest generates hundreds of entries. As a matter of fact, there were over 1,500 entries this year and we award one grand prize along with first through third grade prizes in each of the grade levels. And you can imagine how difficult it is to come up with just one grand prize, but we've managed to do that. And so I am delighted to announce that Trailwind Elementary Art student Arjun Arubaru is this year's grand prize recipient. Woohoo! That is awesome. The grand prize is chosen by the district superintendent, Mr. Kobe Dennis, 
and it will be used as the district's holiday card this year. And uh, along to celebrate this achievement, we have Mrs. Boyd, the uh, principal at Trailwind. We have Mrs. Neris, the third grade teacher. And we also have Arjun's parents. We have Anjali and Serene, they're with us. So let's give a big welcome to them as well. So with that, we would like to unveil the uh, art contest winner. Okay, and here it is. All right, let's be, give a big clap for that. Fantastic. And now, Arjun, we're going to give you a moment to tell us a little bit how you created this and maybe what you thought when you created it. So would you like to share with your parents and your teacher and the principal what you did? Would you like to do that? Okay. Thank you, Bo the Boise School District, for picking me as the winner for the Winter Card Contest. I'll tell you some things about my drawing. So when I first got my contest paper, I thought everything would turn out to be good. But when I was drawing at my home, I kind of ruined it and I was a little upset. So my mom said not to lose hope and courage. If you lose hope and courage, then you can't do anything. So that made me gather all the courage and uh, to ask my teacher for another contest paper. While I was drawing out on my, at my home for this on the second sheet of paper, I picked the wrong shade of brown and I colored it on my deer. Then when I finished completing, when I was finished shading, it still turned good. So I used the same technique for the deer, I mean the trees and the house. I was so proud of my drawing, but I never thought I'd be the winner. So when my principal announced my name, I was so happy. With hope and courage, you can achieve anything. That is fantastic. So Arjun, we have some prizes for you. Um, we have a certificate, as well as a $25 gift certificate, cer certificate to quality art, that's for you, plus 50 cards that are printed with your design so your family can use that to send to family and friends, as well as a prize from the art cottage. So again, we are so happy for you and I love what you said about hope and courage. That's fantastic. Let's give Arjun another round of applause. Today, we're here to recognize a very special art award winner. For years, the Boise School District has had a winter art, art card contest in conjunction with St. Alphonsus Foundation and Festival of Trees. Unfortunately, the festival was canceled this year, but the district opted to hold the contest anyway because it's such a popular event with students. Traditionally, we have two grand prizes. One card winner is chosen to be the design for the Boise District's holiday card. And the other grand prize is selected by St. Alphonsus Foundations to be their holiday card. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to get just one grand prize, especially out of over 1,500 entries. But I am delighted to announce Whitney Elementary student, Elliot Duraco, as this year's St. Alphonsus Foundation grand prize winner. <laughs> Elliot's art was chosen to be the foundation for uses their holiday card. She is a third grade teacher in Miss Altoffer's class and she is here with us today. So we're so glad about that. And with us to celebrate Ellie's achievement is Nancy Bakken. She's part of the St. Al Alphonsus Foundation. Jolene Lincoln, the principal of Whitney Elementary and Madison Altoffer, the third grade teacher. We also have with us so special Elliot's mom, Melissa DeRocco. Unfortunately, her father, uh, Ben is out of town, but we have her grandmother here also. So we're so grateful. Let's give a round of applause for all our guests. And now we're gonna present your award. Are you ready? Okay. And there it is. So before we have Elliot share, we're going to let, um, Ms. Bakken from the foundation, share a few words about St. Alphonse's Festival of Trees. 
Hi, Elliot. I'm Nancy with the St. Alphonsus Foundation. And as Mark mentioned, we didn't hold the Festival of Trees this year, but we really wanted to participate with the art contest and select an image to be used on our Christmas card. And I'm so excited to tell you that it was a unanimous vote. Your piece was beautiful. The colors you used were so pretty. The design was really special. And of course it had Christmas trees in it. And for the Festival of Trees, we're all about the Christmas trees. So we wanted to come and thank you so much for your design and give you a few tokens of our appreciation. The first is a set of Christmas cards with your picture on the front. And you can take those and you can give them to your family and friends and spread your holiday cheer all over. We also have a $25 gift certificate from Quality Art. So you can go buy more art supplies and continue to use your artistic talents. And then we've got an art kit so that you can do what you like to do best, which is create and design. So here you go. And thank you so much for what you do. You keep up the good work, keep being artistic, and thank you so much. My name is Madison Altoffer, and I'm a third grade teacher here at Whitney. And this is my fantastic student, Elliot, and she created this beautiful piece of artwork that we're honoring today. And I am so proud of Elliot because not only is she creative, artistic, and wonderful to have in the classroom, but also she's empathetic and caring and is always making artwork and pictures for her classmates and for her teachers. So if we look at this beautiful piece of art, what are these trees made out of, Elliot? They're so beautiful and the colors are wonderful. Paint samples. Oh, paint samples? Where did you get those from? The store? Yeah, you got them from the store. And then what did you do to the paint samples to get them into that shape? I cut one of the sides into like a half of a triangle and then the other one into a half. And then I put them together and made a tree. Oh my goodness. Well, you're so creative. We've been talking about triangles and math too. <laughs> Wonderful job, Elliot. I'm so proud of you. And so are your classmates and your family members and everyone here at Whitney. Okay, love, love that. And they are way better artists than third, as third graders than, than anything I could create. But uh, so fun to see art going on in our classrooms. And uh, I'm amazed that Superintendent Dennis could actually pick a winner out of that huge crowd. That's, that's a toughie. But thank you for doing that. And thank you for all the students that entered, and especially Arjun and Elliot, for your, for your hard work on that. Next, we will move on to another video presentation for the Yes, I Can Award. The Yes, I Can Awards program was established in Idaho to celebrate the achievements of children and youth with disabilities, to encourage children and youth with disabilities to seek their highest potential, and to increase public awareness of the abilities, aspirations, and personal qualities of people with disabilities. Award nominees may be recognized in one of each of the following nine categories, academics, arts, athletics, community service, employment, extracurricular activities, independent living skills, self-advocacy, and technology. Now let's meet Boise School District's 2021-22 Yes I Can Award recipients. What have your favorite activities at school been? Um, playing sports and hanging out with friends. What jobs have you really liked? I like my job I have right now. I work with Evergreens Resource. I set up tents for wildfires and clean up around the base camps. JJ is basically Mr. Capital. As we saw, he was literally the eagle at one point. Um, he's been on the cheer team, football team, rugby team, helped out with Club Unified. And I have worked with him since his sophomore year. Within our program, he's been looked up to as a leader and always helped out and takes pride in his work. Matt, recess, and studies.
PE leadership and and why ready. Um, I want to be nice. When they said exceptional child, the first thing I thought of was Hudson. Just he walks into a room and it just it lightens and brightens. Um, he just makes everybody feel special. He's so hardworking. You know, things are, are hard for him to do. It's really difficult for him to do some things, but he also just perseveres with everything and he tries his very best and has a great attitude the whole time. What are some of your favorite things to do at school? I remember I loved very much was being with all my teachers and having mm -hmm. fun. What have you learned at your school? Learned about like uh, Mexico. Cameron, can you tell us what you want to do when you grow up? Uh, what I want to do when I grow up is I want to make a business where it's where it makes tech and I also want to help people by um, making uh, uh, robots like for people that will help them. He went from being in a, a, an extended resource room for years and then right before transitioning to junior high, he actually graduated into a resource room because he made so much progress. Um, so reading is a huge strength of his now. He's become very independent and responsible as well, just with daily tasks and even jobs at school um, and kind of managing his own schedule and all his responsibilities. Um, and he's just very, very compassionate too. He went from being not very comfortable being in the general ed classroom to like glowing in there and just, you know, um, like taking it upon himself to understand and fault like what was going on and following the class um, routines and procedures and all of that. What are your favorite activities at school and why? My favorite activities at school is helping other kids because it gives me joy and I know that the school will be even a safer place with me helping. What is your favorite subject and why? My favorite subject is art and history is kind of fun too because history we're making, we, we already made our poster and Google Slides because we're working on a Native American project. What do you want to do when you grow up? It's either I want to be an astronaut aboard the ISS or Mars, Mars, or I want to be a playground supervisor. I'll hire you. Yes. He has a disease called Perthes, which affects his hip. And he has required multiple surgeries as a result of that disease, which has resulted in him spending a lot of time in a wheelchair with both legs in a cast. He has grown from a student that we really thought was going to end up in a special program to this student that's in gen ed um, with very little support from the resource room. He's doing an amazing job in the classroom. He loves learning. He loves his teacher. He loves school. We've been working with him for the last five years and the growth that we have seen from him has been absolutely tremendous. All right, Cooper, what were your favorite activities at school when you attended Boise High? Um, I like to uh, make beats and music production, and I love uh, going to rap club at lunchtime. Uh, what did you learn about yourself by participating in classes and activities at Boise High? I learned that it pays off if you don't give up on, on work because in uh, critical reading and writing, I put a lot of stuff off until the last minute, but I got through it. My dad helped me. Can you tell us a little bit about Cooper and, and why or what made him the best candidate uh, for the Yes, uh, I Can Award? Uh, I, I'll go back to the first time I met Cooper. I, I saw him in the hallway. Uh, he had his little radio there, maybe batteries uh, off to the side, CDs kind of off to the side. What's going on with this kiddo? And every day at lunch, uh, he was listening to Eminem. He was listening to rap. Uh, he came to us with the idea of starting this rap club. Uh, he didn't give up. He never wavered on that. Uh, I remember several times he'd come in my classroom and say, 
Toronto is a rap club today. No, it's not rap club. Feel free to listen to whatever you want. He turned music on and it just evolved into his senior year. Uh, you know, the rap club was once a week and there was a lot of people involved. It was an amazing thing. And it was all because, you know, Cooper stuck with his dream. Uh, so kudos to Cooper. Due to some circumstances out of my control last year, I never got to actually rap against Cooper or hear Cooper rap. Uh, I just wanted to throw a couple of things out there. Uh, you know, I'm not number one. Uh, sorry, I lied. I'm number one, two, three, four, and five. A dope MC is a dope MC. And that's who Cooper Sutton be. Take it away, Coop. I got to say, today was a good day. It's Thursday. My words are like chainsaw blades. Oh, wait. I'm in an interview right now. I don't know why, but for some reason, I'm wanting to shave my eyebrows. <laughs> Thank you for interviewing me. was fun. Um, congratulations to JJ, Hudson, Cameron, JJ, and Cooper. Um, you show that the Boise School District really does provide opportunities for all students of all kinds, and we appreciate you so much for being exemplary um, examples of that and accomplishing so much. Um, with that, we will move on to consent agenda items. Um, is there a consent agenda, any consent agenda item that a trustee would like to pull from the consent agenda? Oh, I skipped. That's bad. I'm sorry. Apologize for that. We're, we're actually going to move on to the ESB reports, and I think we'll start off with Timberline High School. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophia Minnick. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. So we just want to kind of touch on some of the things that's been happening at Timberline lately. We'd like to say that Timberline has made great strides in our school spirit this year. Coming back from COVID, we've created a stronger community, and we really would like to attribute that to our junior class. They've showed up for events and just have made the community a lot stronger. Student Council is proud to say that we've made a lot of progress this year. So far, we've su successfully hosted homecoming dance, homecoming assembly, several spirit weeks, a food can drive that raised over a ton in cans, a uh, gratitude week that was hosted by another leadership group at our school called Wolf Connection. And then student council just recently hosted our winter As we move forward, we hope to see events planned such as dances, return to our Timberline culture Uh, hi, my name is uh, Sarvi Kashikar. I also go to Timberland. I'm a junior. And I just wanted to touch on some of the clubs that we have um, going on at our school. Two of our highest participation clubs, which are namely Tree Club and Key Club, have been working on some great projects. Key Club is focusing on making a documentary surrounding um, our Timberline Wolf Pack that had some controversy and they're just researching about the wolf pack and working with uh, like lawmakers and stuff to figure that situation out. We also have Key Club who recently did Rake Up Boise and we got to help a lot of people who needed help raking up their leaves. And we also um, have been working closely with Mothers Against Drunk Driving to um, promote that in our school and get a lot of student participation with that cause. student council members to reach out into our community and find out what we could do better to make everyone feel inclusive. 
So one thing we did was student council made improvements to our homecoming voting process by removing the title of king and queen to allow for a fair represent representation of people who identify with any varied gender group or expression. As the system is still new to our school, we are working to improve it, but we really hope to make this a more inclusive process in future years. Uh, lastly, we would like to talk about some of the award opportunities that we have at our school. We've revamped our system and we started this new program called Student of the Week where we highlight two exceptional students each week and um, they talk a little bit about what they've done to, um, you know, what exceptional things they've done and how their participation has been. school through spirit weeks and community outreach programs and we like to emphasize the importance of having respect dignity honesty responsibility teamwork and sportsmanship in our school and we hope that our two leadership classes and bodies can um, emphasize that and allow students to be more participating and also have an impact on their community and we'd like to open it up to any questions. Any questions from any of the trustees? Trustee Oppenheimer? Yes. Thank you, President Waiters. Um, great report from both of you. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulty. And so we would love it if there's an opportunity for you to send us your report so we can make sure that we didn't miss anything. That would be really great. Um, I also want to. Um, congratulate you on many of the activities that you've done. And I'm super interested in this documentary and we would love to maybe see that when that's completed. Maybe we could do a presentation, President Wagers, if, if they get that documentary we done. Can, we can see if we, we can get would that love out to, to us. See that. But um, I love all the team spirit that you guys are, are doing and um, the inclusivity is fantastic. So congratulations. Thank you. Trustee Thank you. anyone else? Seeing none. Well, thank you so much, Sophia and Sarabi, for, for taking time out of your night to educate us on what's going on in Timberline. Good stuff. Appreciate all you do. Have a good night. Thank you so much. And next, we will go ahead and move on to Capital High's uh, presentation. All righty. Can you see that? We can. Awesome. President Wagers, distinguished board members, Superintendent Dennis, and district representatives, thank you for the opportunity for us to share the amazing things happening at Capitol High School since our previous board report. So our biggest project since our last report has been Kindness Week. And the goal of this was to promote kindness in and outside of our school especially since we did it right before Thanksgiving break. We just wanted to send students into that break with a positive attitude and thankful hearts. And we kicked that week off with having our Honor Society group doing Rake Up Boise. And each day we had a daily theme that we'll go through, um, dress up days, second period activities. And we gave away a lot of shirts and stickers with our little Capital Kind slogan on them. Yeah, so to kick off Capital Kindness Week, we had our first theme on Monday be Be Community Kind. So for our second period activity, we had each student write a thank you note to businesses around our capital community. And, um, and then we personally had capital students deliver these notes to businesses. And actually, we had some students report um, that Sinclair, one of the gas stations near here, um, had some thank you notes up that we gave them, which was super cool. And then for our dress up day to um, get students excited, we had Jersey day. So we encouraged students to wear their favorite Jersey. And then as a student council, we also went to River Glen and Fairmont to spread kindness through kindness bingo during their lunch. So we invited them to come down and um, do a little kindness activity. We gave away stickers and t-shirts and it was a super fun experience. Day two, 
Um, Tuesday, our theme was be kind to yourself. So the second period activity for that day was for students to write something that they were thankful for on these little leaves that we cut out. And we hung them up on our turkey tom, which has been a tradition for a while, but this is definitely the biggest we ever got him to be. And it was awesome to see in the halls. And then our dress up day was to wear your favorite sweatshirt. Okay, and so for our third day of kindness week, we had be kind to your teachers as a theme. So for the second period activity, we had students write a thank you note to a teacher that really stood out to them this semester. And they could deliver the, the notes to the teachers themselves or they could give it to student council and we would deliver it for them. It was a super fun way to spread positivity and kindness and support for our teachers. And then um, going with the theme, we had twin with your favorite teacher day, which is a fun dress up day that we did. And then as a student council, we went to Valley View and Pierce Park to spread kindness by hanging out with um, elementary kids at recess, which was super fun. Um, we were able to pass out stickers and t-shirts and just have a good time, talk to them about kindness. Day four, our theme was to be kind to your friends. And during our second periods, we, had, we gave students the opportunity to reach out to as many friends as they could just through text which was super fun. And our dress up day was bring anything but a backpack, which was really fun. We had some kids bring like coolers or purses. We had some really creative um, things. It was super fun. And then that evening at the girls basketball game, we did capital cuts for kindness. And we had 14 girls donate 18 or more inches of their hair um, for children with hair loss. And that was a super awesome thing. We're glad we could do it. Okay, and then for our last day of kindness week, it was be kind to your school. So for our second period activity, we had students write one thing they loved about Capitol, and um, we had them write them down on these little cutout eagles that we planned to put up in the hallway to help remind everyone why they love Capitol, which is going to be super fun to spread positivity in the hallways. And then going along with that theme, we had a spirit day, so everyone wore their favorite Capitol gear. And then we had a trash pickup during lunch to help the Capitol parking lot look as clean and show that we love our school. And then just throughout that week, we had a food drive, food slash snack drive going on for our Capitol Food Pantry. And we also started this kindness raffle card where we have teachers give out give students who are representing one of our pride values a card that they can then enter for a raffle to win a t-shirt. So that's a more ongoing thing. And I think this is about two weeks before our kindness week, we had bus driver appreciation week, which you can see in that photo. It was super fun to let them know how much we appreciate their work. And then we also have just been ha having our staff of the month, student of the month, um, going throughout the whole year and recognizing staff birthdays and all those little things. And finally, we wanted to go over some upcoming events that we're planning. So um, one of these events are the Battle of the Real CHS. So it's a competition between Centennial and I, uh, Centennial and Capital. So um, we're working on that right now, a basketball competition. And then finals gifts for the students to help motivate them through the last week before Christmas break. And then we're also planning Buff Puff, which is a tournament for capital guys to get involved with volleyball. And then we also have Mr. CHS that's coming up, which is a talent show for um, senior boys as well. And then also sophomores and juniors just received their PSAT scores. So next semester, they're gonna be working on goals that will hopefully help the school reached the literacy smart goal that we have of more students reaching the benchmark. And um, that's just what we have planned. So um, we also just wanted to say that we were really happy with how uh, Kindness Week went. And we're super excited for these upcoming events that will help spread um, positivity and kindness throughout Capital, and overall help Capital to have a better culture and community. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Chris and Anya. Love the idea of Kindness Week. So thanks, thanks for doing that. Comments from Trustee uh, Greeley. Thank you, President Wagers. Um, Kristen and Anya, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, we love in particular hearing how 
not just kindness, I mean, first of all, how you focus on kindness within your community at school, but within your neighborhood community, but also the feeder schools, the other schools and, you know, that connected to capital. So it's just a really wonderful presentation and um, great work that you guys are doing. And then Trustee Oppenheimer. Thank you, President Waiters. Um, I too echo the sentiments around Kindness Week and the two um, days that specifically stood out to me um, well, was first um, what Trustee Greeley was saying about kindness to not only the community within Capitol High, but also outside of the community. And the fact that you are all being mentors to our younger generation um, and providing that mentorship around kindness. Everyone wants to feel loved and appreciated, and I really um, think it's great that you guys are doing that. Um, and then the other day that I really, really loved was Be Kind to Yourself Day. And I think that that's so important that we all take a moment and, and just be kind to ourselves and really practice um, some of that just appreciation for ourselves and just love ourselves. So um, thank you for all of that. And it sounds like it's good. And I hope that you all continue with some of the activities of Kindness Week throughout the year. Good work. Yay. Any other, any other comments from trustees? <laughs> Hearing none, yay for you two. You get the rest of the night off. Thanks, thanks so much for being here and thanks for sharing with the board. Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, now we'll move on to that really exciting consent agenda that I was wanting to get to. Um, any, any items that trustees would like to pull from the consent agenda at this time? Seeing none, I would hear, entertain a motion. Trustee Greeley. Thank you, President Wagers. I move approval of the consent agenda items one through five, enclosures one through 22. And a second from Trustee Langley. So oh, it's, oh, who was it? Oh, Trustee Gregory. That, Dave, is, Dave is deaf in one side, so it just kind of, it got there. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Greeley, seconded by Trustee Gregory, um, that we approve all items in consent agenda in, in enclosures one through 22. All in, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. With that, we will move on to reports and recommendations. And we'll start off with a budget modification. And I believe we probably have our CFO, Nancy Landon. Um, thank you, President Wagers. You have before you this evening a request to increase the general fund budget in the amount of $96,399. The reason for this request is um, a number of schools at the high school level have requested grants from the Department of Vocational Education, and those grants have been awarded. So in order to give them spending authority, I need you to grant that authority. Sounds, sounds like a good, good thing. Um, any questions from trustees for Nancy Landon? Uh, Trustee Gregory? Uh, President Wagers, I move approval of the budget modification outlined in enclosures, uh, in enclosure 23. Second. Second from Trustee Haas. It's been moved and seconded to include, uh, pass the budget modification included in enclosure 23. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we will move on to our pandemic operation report. I believe we have uh, Deputy Superintendent Lisa Roberts. Thank you. Good evening, President Wagers, trustees, and a special welcome to Trustee Schmidt. We're glad that you're here this evening. Uh, as many with as with many items that we've discussed during the pandemic, preparing for tonight's COVID-19 operations plan presentation has not been simple. In fact, we've had to make some adjustments in the last 24 hours. I will say, however, right now I'm thinking of Arjun, hope and courage, we can do anything. So I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind. Last week, as we were preparing for tonight's presentation, we believed there, were, there was compelling evidence, including support from our local health professionals, that the board could consider making masks optional as early as the return from winter break on January 10th. Given the impact of the potential change, we felt it only fair and transparent to share the information we believed we would present for the board tonight. We shared the presentation with staff and allowed them to offer comments and ask questions. 
We know that recording has been shared with the media and seen by many. The agenda published on Friday also reflected the information provided to staff. Tonight's presentation, however, is going to look different than what was shared last week during the information received um, that was shared last week due to information we received last night from the local health professionals that we consult with on a regular basis. During the call, myself, Superintendent Dennis, Tamara Fredrickson, our health services administrator, and in a letter received today, Dr. Bramwell and Dr. Nasser have revised their recommendation and are encouraging us to continue with masks. During this next Q&A, they will explain why their guidance changed, and through our presentation after the question and answer period, you'll see our recommendation. So at this time, and we've done Q&As before over the last couple of years, I've, we've kind of had a different setting. I'm gonna try it from here and see how this works. We have three guests tonight for our Q&A. We have Dr. Kenny Bramwell, we have Dr. Mark, Mark Nasser, and we have Rob Howarth, and I hope I pronounced that right correctly, Rob, from Central District Health. I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves and just tell you a little about their expertise and experience. And we'll start with Rob. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Howarth. I'm a division administrator at Central District Health. You most likely would be used to seeing our director, Russ Duke, or one of my COVID response team members. Um, but today I'm standing in. I have a background in environmental quality and environmental health. So I'm definitely not, not a medical expert, but I am glad to share any perspectives from Central District Health and kind of add public health flavor to the discussion tonight. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Dr. Nasser. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Roberts. Uh, my name is Mark Nasser. I am a family physician and occupational medicine physician. And um, I currently serve at the St. Alphonsus Medical Group. And um, my background is in primary care and uh, public health preventive medicine. It's been it's an honor to work with uh, the BSD leadership and to be with you tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having us here this evening. Uh, I was really enjoying the presentations earlier. I thought we could just stop with learning to be perse to pe persevere and to keep moving. But uh, uh, we have some other things to discuss. Uh, my, my background is in emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine. My current role with St. Luke's is I'm the system medical director for St. Luke's Children's Hospital and what's called the service line. And uh, as Mark mentioned, it's, uh, it's our pleasure to work with the Boise School District and certainly with your superintendents and Tamara. Thank you. And I would like to make sure the board knows um, Dr. Bramwell, Dr. Nasser, and Central District Health have been great partners for us throughout this entire um, situation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions. In our regularly scheduled meetings, Dr. Bramwell and Dr. Nasser, you had indicated you would support a move to masks being optional versus required after winter break. As we've seen throughout this pandemic, things can change quickly. We met last night for an update, and your guidance related to masks being optional has changed. Can you please explain and also give us an update on the hospital systems? And we'll start with you, Dr. Bramwell. Thank you. Uh, I, I will share with you, uh, board, as, as well as the audience, that uh, when we started writing the letter that many of you saw late last week, uh, it was about three weeks ago. I think it was right before Thanksgiving break. The, and uh, things were very different at that time. We were coming out of crisis standards of care. It looked like uh, things might be calming down. And uh, as, as COVID has done over and over, uh, there was a pivot, a change in the wind, a new variant and a new set of problems. So in, in essence, uh, while we were in, in my mind, hoping to discuss the possibilities of, of, of a transition, um, I, I think a lot of people interpreted what uh, Mark and I had written as discouraging masks and that we were pivoting away from our recommendations previously. And, and uh, uh, I apologize for the confusion and uh, I, I wish it had been more clear. But certainly at this point, uh, I would say that given the new information uh, with the Omicron variant, given the status of uh, coming out of crisis standards of care, but still uh, not backing down to the levels that we had, say, last summer, uh, we, we feel at this point that, that the masking should continue. Dr. Nasser, would you like to add anything to that? 
Thank you, Lisa. I would just add to Dr. Bramwell, the, um, we were seeing a nice steady decline in uh, COVID um, cases, if you will, uh, in the hospital, uh, one of the indicators, but that seems to have plateaued also in the last uh, couple of weeks and now uh, a definite leveling in our health system. And as we're talking with some of our partner hospitals in the state, uh, some are maybe even seeing a slight increase as well. Um, some of that may be an effect of the new variant as we're just now discovering it in the state. Some of it also might be an, an effect of, of some recent gatherings and holidays. And so we're watching that very closely, but that also adds um, more information in this very dynamic um, you know, journey that we've all been on together trying to respond uh, to this COVID pandemic. Thank you. Mr. Howarth, what would Central District Health recommend regarding mask wearing in our schools? Well, I think what the two doctors just relayed is um, obviously what we're seeing too. And um, the, the recommendation to continue to use masks, if at all possible, is still um, matching the CDC, gu CDC guidelines, which we would also recommend. So it just seems, it seems prudent at this time. I think we, um, I think we all are a little bit uh, concerned about what we're seeing, not, not maybe yet so much in Idaho, but nationwide with the increase in cases. And I, I think we are definitely in favor of trying to do what we can to minimize having another spike if that's where we're headed. Thank you. We have heard that we are moving from a pandemic to COVID-19 being endemic. Could you please explain what this means for our schools? And we'll start with Dr. Nasser. Thanks, thank you. Uh, any sort of disease in the community um, that comes in at, at a higher than expected rate of what we normally would see might be considered um, by a public health term to be called an epidemic. And when those higher than normal rates start happening in large geographic areas, either in multiple states, multiple countries, or in the case of COVID all around the world, and that's what defines a, a pandemic. Um, as a disease settles down and it remains present, you know, long-term in, in an area, it, with some level of predictability to the amount of disease that's there, then we consider the disease to have um, become endemic, which means it just is, it is present in our community. And the rate of spread, is a little bit more predictable um, and expected. So I, I would say that with COVID, as it began to settle and the rates of, of disease began to come down in between these surges, we, we were thinking of it from a medical standpoint as transitioning from the pandemic into what we would call endemic or you know, what's expected. What makes it challenging is that um, we, we've continued to have multiple significant surges this last um, most current fourth surge has been um, very significant, uh, so much so that it put us into the crisis standards of care in the state of Idaho. So um, with, with these continued higher than expected case numbers, um, th that, would be, that would be evidence of the pandemic. And, and as we go, oscillate up and down uh, with those numbers, we'll be, we would be watching for it to enter the endemic phase. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Bramo, would you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll just try and summarize uh, what Mark really eloquently described. Uh, a pandemic is a high rate of occurrence over a large area. An epidemic is a high rate of occurrence in a small or very focal area. And endemic is a low rate over a large area. And as Dr. Nasser mentioned, endemic uh, issues commonly are much more predictable, or at least we can plan for and about them. And lastly, Mr. Howard, did you want to add anything from Central District Health's perspective? No, I appreciate the descriptions, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Bramwell. Perfect. Thank you. We're going to stick with you, Mr. Howard. And I'd like to ask you other districts in our valley, they do not have mask mandates, they are not contact tracing, and they are not quarantining exposed students. Can you tell us how this is affecting the spread of COVID 19? Can you tell us how that is um, affecting the spread of COVID-19 in those districts? And I believe in Central District Health, we would be talking most likely about West Ada School District and CUNA School District. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it's, it's really hard to tell the direct impact that might be having on the schools and the community. Um, we are still in a 
high level of community transmission throughout Ada County. And in fact, three of the four counties that we serve in Central District Health's region are in high levels of community transmission. That means that uh, the likelihood that someone is exposed to the virus and may be infected by the virus, whether it's in school or um, going to a family event or just going grocery shopping, it's really hard to discern where that infection might occur. So um, it's definitely not helpful, I would say, to, um, to not have mitigation measures in place. And it's difficult to discern again in a situation where throughout the community, we're seeing high levels of transmission. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nasser, we're going to begin with you on this one. Parents have expressed concern about the effects wearing a mask has on their child's physical and mental health. Are there, could you speak to those concerns and what you've heard? Yeah, I, I think that um, for comfort and for the ability to communicate easier, um, most parents and most students would desire to not be wearing a mask. I think that's probably universally felt and and um, I think folks, uh, you know, would like to have a desire to get back, get back to that. As far as for um, a physical um, or mental harm from wearing the mask, um, we don't have evidence that it's uh, physically harmful to, to wear a mask. I do recommend that it would be a clean washed mask or disposable mask and that it would be, you know, changed at an appropriate, you know, rate. In the medical community, even before the pandemic, we would, in the surgical areas, we often would wear masks all day long when dealing with patients and certainly in operative areas. And so um, this is a situation where we're really doing it in an effort to try to reduce transmission. Um, there, there may be certain um, unique situations with, for parents that, that have a child that have some unique situation where they're not able to keep the mask on or the very young children, we don't expect them to. And, and so those situations are, are kind of a case by case basis, but uh, we do want to be able to communicate that um, it, it's safe for children to, um, and uh, it's helpful from, from preventing transmission. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what I will share with you, I, I think I've shared with the board previously, but I think it bears repeating. You know, uh, if we look at the respiratory season from a year ago, so December of 2020 through April of 21, uh, in the Children's Hospital, we, we did not admit a single kid with respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. Um, what, that, what that tells me is that last year when, when we were a bit more serious about masking in more places, um, not only was that helpful for COVID, but it was helpful for preventing all viruses as well as strep and everything else that spreads person to person. So while I can certainly understand that masks are inconvenient and masks are at times unpleasant, I, I don't feel that there's a downside to physical or mental health from wearing masks. Um, I'll share with you, I, I worked over the weekend in the emergency department at Meridian. I had a mask on for eight or nine hours each of those days. Uh, I, I, I found it unpleasant. Um, it, it doesn't make me happy to wear a mask that long. But at the same time, I don't think that I suffered any consequences from wearing the mask. And if I can extend that to children, you know, I, I don't think there is any evidence that this has any adverse effects on children. It may be unpleasant. It may not be something that they like. But I've also noticed that it tends to be far more of an issue for the adults than it does for the children. Children commonly just don't care. Thank you. If masks are optional... This, and actually this next question has, I think, three different parts to it. So Dr. Um, we're gonna start with Dr. Nasser. If masks are optional, would you expect infection rates to go up? How protected are fully vaccinated pe people if they are not masked? How protected am I if I choose to wear a mask but no one else wears a mask? Did you hear that, Dr. Nasser? Sorry, <laughs> three parts. I did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we know that the vaccine provides additional immunity and protection for those who receive it. Now the vaccine is approved for age five and up. Um, you know, previously, many adults have received the vaccine, and it gives them some some enhanced level of immunity. Um, this uh, this is one important. 
uh, layer of protection and one important path for us uh, we think out of the pandemic would be the importance of getting immunity in the community through vaccination being a key part of that. The, uh, the masks, if they were not worn, we would expect somebody with a, who is positive for COVID or any respiratory related virus or illness to be able to transmit that easier than if they were covering their mouth because we know that it's transmitted through the respiratory route. And so we would expect um, those who are sick uh, who are wearing a mask, it, they would have a lower amount of transmission to those around them. Uh, the other way to achieve that is distance and, and get some distance between you and that other person. Um, so somebody who has vaccination, they have some enhanced immunity. If they're wearing a mask, they're also providing protection to others and to themselves. And that was, I think, the last part of the comment. Really, the mask um, where is, is a substitute for distance in that it helps reduce the transmission of respiratory droplets. And so if we do it together, it's, it's much more effective than if one person is wearing it by themselves. Although there is some protection wearing it yourself, it really, it really uh, works better uh, together. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Do you have something you'd like to add? Sure. One of the things that is a, a pretty helpful experiment uh, I'll, I'll describe here. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the Peanuts characters, uh, pig pen, um, this, this will be helpful. Um, go outside uh, later this evening, uh, stand in a place where there's a bright light behind you and where it's dark in front of you and just stand there and breathe for a few minutes. And, and you'll notice how far your breath goes without you even doing anything. It's, it's easily three feet, sometimes it's farther. So the, the masks are just one way to limit that exposure. I think that when it's been studied, uh, masking versus not masking. The CDC has published data that it's between two and two and a half times more likely to get an infection if you're in a school where masking is not required versus masks not uh, being required. I may have said that backwards. The, the masking drops the, the infection rate in half, sometimes a little bit more. Um, certainly, uh, if we think of all of these different layers of protection, the vaccine is probably the best possible thing we can do to protect ourselves and protect others. Um, I would say that the vaccine has, has a, uh, the ability to drop serious infections by a factor of 10. So if you think of the masks as being a factor of two and the, and the vaccine is a factor of 10, that, that, that's a, a rough uh, uh, comparison of how effective one is versus the other, but, but certainly they're, they're both effective. And I, I think that they're additive. We've also seen that people who are vaccinated, when they get COVID, they have it for a shorter period of time and they shed it for a shorter period of time. So, so all of these things sort of play together to try and help us get through this. Thank you. On this next question, we're going to start with Mr. Howarth. What is the latest information you're able to share about the Omicron variant? And if there's cause for concern in our community, particularly related to the issue of mask wearing? What I'm reading about Omicron today is that um, there's still a general thought that it's very transmissible. Um, I don't know how much more than the Delta variant, if at all, but very transmissible. And there's still studies underway to find out, um, uh, I guess, how much illness it caused. So right now the reports are that uh, it's, it's very contagious. Um, and I guess information is still being sought about how uh, how infectious it is um, in terms of causing severe illness. Um, I'm reading some information from the United Kingdom today that uh, it's really taken off there in just a matter of, uh, of a few days or weeks. And I think that's the concern here, just not knowing uh, its full impact. So um, I, I believe that's uh, what I can relay at this point. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Would you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I agree with what Rob said. There, there's a lot that we just don't know yet. It is really week to week right now, as far as what we know about Omicron. It, early indicators suggest that it may be more contagious than Delta, which makes me shudder a bit. If you think of how much more contagious Delta has been and how much more devastating it has been just because it's more contagious, um, that, that, that gives me pause because the, that has been the biggest problem. Delta was not more significant in the type of illnesses that it caused it was not more problematic for the people who caught it. It was, it was just as serious as prior variants. It just was 
uh, five to eight times more contagious. And, and that's how we ended up um, in, in such dire straits uh, because of how contagious the Delta variant was. So it, 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 it worries me if this is more contagious. Thank you, Dr. Nasser. Anything to add? I uh, agree with uh, Dr. Bramwell and with Mr. Haworth. I think much to be learned with Omicron variant, um, much, much that we don't know. Um, the transmissibility, the severity, the number of cases are all important questions we should be considering. I think some of the early data, perhaps out of South Africa, suggests um, a significant number of cases in younger population than we've seen previously. And I think that should be watched very carefully as well. Thank you. Dr. Nasser, we're going to start with you on this next question. Can you speak about the current COVID-19 vaccinations that are available to those parents of, of children who are el eligible? Speak to the parents of the children who are eligible. Will children need to have a booster shot? As you know, we've held a number of vaccination clinics in our schools for parents who choose to have their student vaccinated. What role, I think you've actually answered quite a bit of this in your last question, does getting the vaccine seeing play in mitigating spread of the virus for those who choose to get vaccinated? Sure. For, for those who choose to get vaccinated, and we encourage everyone to consider this if you're eligible, and that would be for all children aged five and up and all adults. Um, the, we believe it to have a very important role in, in uh, moving as a community through and out of the pandemic. Um, right now, booster shots are recommended for adults age 18 and up, and we don't know yet about children, but I think the research is currently being done um, to determine recommendations uh, for those under 18 as well. So vaccinations are widely available in our community. We've partnered uh, between the health systems and the clinics in a very collaborative way from the earliest availability of the vaccine um, to try to um, share and provide vaccinations for all Idahoans. Uh, who would like it, and, and today it's, it should be easily available for, for those who are looking for it at, at most clinics, some pharmacies in the area, and, um, and again, as mentioned, for, for and some of the school-sponsored clinics as well. Thank you, Mr. Howarth. Anything to add? I will just add that um, at least earlier in the, the vaccine rollout when there was more interest, we had some good success. Um, matching facilities, uh, you know, manufacturing plants, um, businesses and schools with vaccine providers. So if Boise School District or any other schools are interested in having us um, try to help match you with uh, mobile vaccine clinics or uh, other options for vaccine, uh, I believe that we can still get that done. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. Anything left to add? Uh, one of the questions that I, I'm not sure if, if we've been able to answer yet, and I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer, is whether or not children who get a primary series of two vaccines will need a booster shot in the future. The, the short answer is we don't yet know. Um, the longer answer is the, the immunization, or I'm sorry, the uh, immune systems of small children are sometimes really exceptionally adept at creating the necessary responses the, the children from the ages of five to 11 are getting one third the dose that the adults get. Um, and this is a, a, a tiny amount to be sure. And some of that's related to their weight, but some of it is also related to the, the reaction that their immune system can generate. So it's, I think it's reasonably likely that they will need a boost booster shot in the future, but I, I don't think we know that yet. I, I imagine we will in the next six to 12 months though. Okay, thank you. Oh, Dr. Bramwell, we'll start with you on this question. Do you foresee other treatments becoming available in the future for the treatment of COVID-19? And if so, could you please elaborate? Boy, I sure wish there were. I sure wish something, something were being studied and was showing promise. But, but right now, the, the greatest tool that we have in COVID is the vaccine by an order of magnitude. It's, it's, it's far better than anything else we have available. We have uh, treatments that can happen if people get exceptionally sick and need to be admitted to the hospital. We have what's called supportive care where they give, we give them oxygen, we give them IV fluids. Sometimes there are monoclonal antibodies that can be given to try and keep people out of the hospital. The convalescent plasma, which was in vogue a year ago, is going away because it's been shown not to be effective. And uh, we're also running out of supply, but it, it, it wasn't particularly uh, it's not a big loss because we weren't using it a lot and it, it wasn't as good as the monoclonal antibodies. Um, 
that's a, that's a long-winded answer for no i don't think of, i know of anything else that's coming that's going to be anywhere near as helpful as the vaccines thank you dr nasser i agree with dr bramwell and just we really look forward to the active research happening with many of the potential treatments that have been considered previously and new treatments and that are coming out uh, that we hope will make a difference as we move forward in this pandemic so i think more to follow on uh, with treatments and and we remain hopeful um, that the future will, will hold some uh, some of more effective treatments that can be widespread, uh, widely used. Thank you. I have just one question left on um, the the questions that were submitted previously from the board, and then we will open it up to see if the board has additional questions. Give you each a chance to answer. Going into the holidays and extended break, what words of advice would you give to our students and families? And we'll start with you, Dr. Nasser. Thank you. I would just um, recommend that folks um, be thoughtful about their activities, that they stay safe, um, that they um, think about uh, where we're at as a community in, in this uh, pandemic, um, you know, make some decisions about their activities and gatherings that, uh, that help them to remain as safe as possible. I know many folks will be gathering and traveling and trying to connect with family, and that's a wonderful thing to do. We just encourage it be to be done in the, as safe as possible. Thank you, Dr. Bramwell. I'll, I'll just reemphasize, I, I think the best thing we can do as individuals and as members of a family and tribe and community is to get vaccinated. I think that it's been a, a game changer. And I think the more of us that can get vaccinated, the quicker we can move forward. And, uh, and I would also say selfishly as an emergency physician, it would be great to see things that aren't COVID. It would be great to, to, to get back to taking care of uh, other illnesses and not feeling quite so overrun by patients who have COVID. Um, I would add that uh, if you're going to be out in public, you're, you're gonna go shopping, you're gonna uh, be indoors for a prolonged period of time, I, I'd recommend wearing a mask. Like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's a bit inconvenient, um, but I think it's the best thing we can do to, to protect ourselves from this sort of ever increasingly infectious organism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howarth. Anything you'd like to add? Well, I think we'll, we're all, we are all certainly looking forward to spending time maybe away from school or work for a little while with family and friends. We want people certainly to keep that in the forefront. But I guess I would just add that, um, uh, I guess, uh, resist the urge to go to a holiday party or a family event if you're feeling sick, you know, Keep in mind that uh, symptoms could be relatively mild, but you can still spread the disease to others. So just stay sick or stay home if you are sick and uh, don't spread it to others. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to open it up to the trustees if they have any additional questions that we were not in the- Any questions from trustees? Uh, Trustee Schmidt. Yes, uh, thanks President Wagers. Um, so early in the question and answer series, um, Dr. Bramwell, Dr. Nasser, you spoke about the levels and, and kind of what changed your position that, you know, about three weeks ago, you were working on this letter. We were in a different situation and you talked about the trends. Um, I'm an engineer. I like to look at data. I like to see trends and it kind of helps give me some idea where things are going. You mentioned, uh, Dr. Nasser, that it seems that COVID cases have plateaued in our hospitals right now. If those COVID cases began to decline again, would this affect your, your position on this? Or it, and if they do, is there some threshold where you would say, okay, this seems like we're at a level where we can tolerate uh, considering the, the removal of masks? Yeah, thank you, Trustee Schmidt. I can start and maybe Dr. Bramwell has more comments. Um, really appreciate the question. So the... Um, Coming out of this latest Delta surge, or what we call the fourth surge, um, thankfully the hospitalizations began to decline. We were able to move out of, as a state crisis standards of care, at least in this in our portion here um, in the South, crisis standards of care. Um, and uh, as we're starting to consider, consider reduction in, in active case transmission rates and hospitalizations, um, this is how this conversation, I think, uh, became um, very hopeful and 
And now what we started to see is kind of a flattening or a plateauing of admissions in both the main hospital and the intensive care unit that are still at a significantly higher level than they were at the lowest, you know, after pre after previous surge. So that's one indicator we would like, like to see those come down. Just to give you an example, it's probably four times still higher than it was when we really got to our lowest level in previous surges. Um, we're, you know, for example, if we were at, at 10 or under previously, now we're still in the 40 to 50 admitted patients any given day range. And some of those are in the intensive care unit. And that's just in one health system. So that's one key indicator I would consider. Um, there's, a, when you look at COVID transmission in the community, there's active case rates. So the number of cases per 100,000 population. So we're currently in the high transmission or red category because we have greater than 100 cases per 100,000. And I think some of that data might be presented a little bit later to the board. Um, we'd love to see that come down much lower uh, to put us in the low transmission. So that means that there's low there's low spread happening in the community. So um, a corollary to that would be a test positivity rate right now. So when you come in and we test you, how often are you positive? And I think it's at this point approaching 10%, which is still quite significant. Um, we've seen that much lower before. So I think a combination of spread in the hospitals the number of cases you know being shared and the positivity rate are just a few factors that the board could consider um and, and that we consider when we're looking at at the at all the data with um the, the leadership at bsd thank you uh trustee langley uh this would be great for either of the uh, doctors um I'm curious how you see vaccination avail availability changing your recommendation, or are we just, you know, what's the vaccination to masking ratio there for the long term? I'm I'm going to ask you to try and help me understand the first part of that question. Uh, oh. Something about vaccine availability. Yeah, is it going to reduce? I mean, is there? Is there a point where you think that the community will be vaccinated enough that we don't need masks or at what point do you see that is vaccination going to ever be something that we then get away from masking? That's a great question. Certainly early on, I think we were hoping that there would be a vaccination within the near future. I'm going to back up 20 months ago where we thought, gosh, if only we could get a vaccine, we could get out of this. We could end this. Um, and then middle of last December, it became available. I remember getting mine on one of the first days. And I thought, this is great. We're out of this. People are going to get vaccinated and, and, and we're going to be able to move on. And um, there was a bit of a run on, on the various clinics and hospitals where these vaccines were being uh, offered. Um, we had more than 100,000 people sign up in an hour. Uh, and it sort of broke our system, uh, to be honest with you. Um, there was an enormous amount of uh, demand early on, and, and that dwindled over that, the ensuing months. Um, certainly as, as things pivoted and as different groups opened up and different age groups became uh, able to get the vaccine, um, we, we never really hit the, the sort of outpaced demand and minimal supply that we hit uh, 10 months ago. Um, we're at a point now where I, I think if you uh, used your phone or your computer and you wanted to get vaccinated tomorrow, you probably could be because the, the demand is, is, is quite low, uh, not only for adults, but, but also for children. Um, so we, we are at a point now where there is uh, abundance of vaccines, but we, we still aren't at getting uh, upward trends that we need. I, I don't know if the number is 70 or 75 or 80 or where herd immunity kicks in and where we have enough people vaccinated that we can pivot away, but, but it seems really clear that 40% is not enough and that 50% is not enough. Um, so I, I, I wish I had something more definitive to tell you. I, I will share with you that depending on how contagious these different variants are, um, the, the percentage of patients that need to be vaccinated goes up, um, which is why you occasionally hear about uh, outbreaks or epidemics of, of, of measles because it's so overwhelmingly contagious that if you drop below 80%, I'm sorry, 85% with, with measles, I believe, then, then an epidemic can develop. So, so that's a, a bit of a long-winded answer for, I don't know we're going, when we're going to be able to get away from masks, but it will certainly require um, a higher percentage of vaccination 
and sort of ongoing public health measures until we get there. As a, maybe as a quick follow up to that, probably for uh, Mr. Howarth, um, do you have an idea of how many students uh, are actually vaccinated or have begun the vaccination schedule? And maybe in Ada County? Yes, that's also a great question. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I think um, if I could refer you to the state of Idaho coronavirus website and their vaccine data dashboard, you can at least um, see numbers by age group, which you could imply, you know, to be the, the age of, of certain student groups that you're interested in. I just don't know the number off my head. I get, I think in general, I just convey that it's, um, it's, it's pretty bleak from a public health perspective. There are not enough students or uh, younger children being vaccinated. I have, I have data if you're interested. These are statewide. Uh, for the children ages 5 to 11, we have 12% of children who are vaccinated. From This is from the website. Um, statewide, again, uh, ages 12 to 15, it's 39% of those children. And ages 16 and 17, 44% are vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Bramo. Other questions from trustees? Trustee Haas? Yes, on. Um, so I received your, uh, Dr. Uh, Nasser and Romwell, I received your letter, your updated letter, new letter, at four o'clock today, two hours before this meeting. So I spent uh, last week and uh, this weekend uh, reviewing your letter of December 2nd. The December 2nd letter was pretty straightforward and clear in my mind. Um, and basically, based on the factors that you articulated in that letter, uh, those factors being um, that due to recent improvement with uh, COVID-19 activity in our community and the retreat from COVID, uh, from crisis standards of care uh, with Pfizer uh, vaccine now approved for five to 11 year old children um, and then another factor was by 2022, uh, Boise School District students ages five and up will have been afforded the opportunity to receive a COVID vaccine. So you qualified those recommendations in that September, excuse me, December 2nd letter that says these recommendations are based on current information and trends. If there's a material change such as a new spike in COVID community spread or a significant concern with hospital resources, it would be critical for the board to remain flexible and reconsider, and reconsider the masking policy change. That's a fundamental change as outlined in your, in your uh, letter that I got today at four o'clock. Um, what, what I heard from you earlier today is we're at a critical level. I mean, we have, the numbers are high, but things have have tabled out, whereas your analysis in the December 2nd letter says, if there is a material change, such as a new spike, or um, a concern with hospital resources, then we should reconsider that. So my question to you is, at what point did you rethink your approach, which is a different approach and analysis, uh, and why, why, the, why the fundamental change? Then I go, Mark, you want me to go? Sure, go ahead, Kenny. Yeah. So uh, I think that, first of all, uh, when we started to write that letter a few weeks ago, uh, as, as, as we said uh, a bit ago, I think we were at a different spot, uh, as, as we outlined there, uh, where we thought that we were going to continue to have a, a decrease in cases. Um, this was before Omicron or before... Uh, there had been any change in our inpatient status. Uh, additionally, uh, I think that Dr. Nasser and I had, had written that letter with the intent that it was going to be uh, shared with the board uh, and that it would be sort of not necessarily consent agenda, but, but pre-work, I will call it. Uh, last week, late last week, uh, it, it became very public. And I think that there was some concern from uh, both the folks at, at my uh, St. Luke's system as well as at St. Al's, that we were not in alignment with CDC guidelines or that our 
position was not clear that we still felt like masking was critically important. So uh, over the weekend, uh, there was quite a flurry of activity and additional meetings as your superintendent uh, outlined earlier. And uh, we, we tried to make it as clear as we could today. But you're right, it, it, is, it is a bit of a pivot and uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that confusion. I would say that in addition to that, um, trustee, that um, we've had another couple weeks of being able to monitor the trends and another couple weeks of awareness of the new variant. I think that all contributes. Um, I think the importance of adhering to um, current public health guidelines is what we can offer as the safest um, or best, re best medical recommendation. Um, and these are all um, you know, decisions where you're trying to look at a range of options as a board, and it's a, it's a range of potential risks and benefits as you're trying to consider how to move forward um, with, with your school district. And we want to try to offer the best advice as, off, as much as we can, which is somewhat dynamic, um, you know, through this whole process has been, I, I believe it will continue to be. Um, we also appreciate that there's operational and educational factors that all go into this as well that are a little bit outside of the medical lane. And that's where you as a board are trying to pull all that together. Um, but from a medical standpoint, if you look at how can we best, knowing that the, knowing that the disease is still present in the community, we're not 100% sure which direction it's gonna go <laughs> as we enter the holidays and emerge from the holidays, um, trying to offer best, best medical advice. Um, uh, for, for the greatest reduction in risk of transmission and, and the safest um, alignment to try to keep children in, in school. You know, we very much align with the BSD interests, you know, for safe in-person education and want to continue to try to provide advisement that would support that as well. So thank you. Trustee Langley. Uh, thank you, President Majors. Um, so, Dr. Bramwell, you mentioned that RSV, um, you had not seen any in 2020. But I'm just um, going back to that to clear up because I just can't totally remember. Um, what did you say was the, uh, the 2021 numbers for RSV? Was it higher or lower? Or? Yeah, it's, it's been dramatically high since about July. Uh, usually in, within the children's hospital, uh, we have... Uh, lots of extra room over the course of the summer because uh, it's not respiratory season. People aren't getting RSV. They aren't getting uh, pneumovirus or paranumovirus. They aren't getting influenza. Uh, this July, uh, we had to send a few patients out of state because we were overrun with patients with RSV, sort of the, the patients who maybe didn't get it last year, um, got it with a vengeance this summer. And, and we've had exceptionally high inpatient needs for uh, children since, since July. We, we have, in essence, had a, a six-month respiratory season already uh, because last year there were so few patients, uh, I believe because of masking and distancing that everybody was doing, that, uh, that some of those small infants and toddlers didn't get exposed, and then they did this summer when we started to relax. You know, to, to back up a, a question or two, you know, we, we, have, we have come really close before to, to coming out of masking. Um, in fact, we, over the, the, the spring and the summer, we thought we were going to enter this, uh, this fall without masks. And, and it wasn't really until, I believe, August, perhaps the week before school, that, that uh, we, we gathered again and said, man, looking at all these data, I, I think we've got to keep in with the masks. Which, which thankfully you, you supported. But, but we, have, um, we, have, we have certainly sort of pivoted and, and changed in response to data before. Um, but, but back to the question about RSV and other, other respiratory issues, um, that, that, that's been an ongoing problem for a handful of months already. Uh, sort of uh, the, the children's hospital being taxed for room uh, because of, of so many patients with uh, other, other viral illnesses. Any other questions from trustees? We still have a presentation after this too, so. Okay, 
I don't see any. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. I, I sorry the school district has become part of your part of your day on a regular basis. Um, we appreciate you sharing, um, advising, and uh, I hope you have a good evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. At this time, if we want to pull up our update report. Joining me this evening will be Area Director Brian Walker, Area Director Becca Anderson, and Tamara Fredrickson, our Health Services Administrator. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So I, you all know this. We've talked about this numerous times. We, are, um, we, we routinely use interest-based decision-making, where we go back and we really firmly look at our interests. And it, when the uh, pandemic began, and we were trying to decide, gosh, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with that? We decided we probably needed to do that again and be grounded in our interests. So just a reminder, as we make decisions, our interests include high quality in-person, comprehensive educational experience five days a week. We want to respect national and local guidance and follow practices to ensure the safety of students and staff. We want to be creative, flexible, and sustainable in our instruction, school operations, and problem solving. And right now, I would like to really do give a shout out to um, our educators in the Boise School District. They have worked diligently this fall to really help make sure that we are um, problem solving in our classrooms and offering, um, you know, great instruction for our kids. So again, just in determining which mitigation strategies will be implemented during community transmission, our district will consider that guidance provided by the national and local health professionals and current district data. So at this time, we're going to go through some of that data with you. And um, at the end, you'll have a chance again to ask more questions. Area Director Walker. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, President Wagers and trustees. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, I want to start with just some current community data that the doctors referred to. If you look at the current case rate from last week, it's uh, 177, and the current uh, positivity rate from last week is 8.74. And what I would say, similar to what they were saying about the hospital, hospitals and how things have leveled off, I think when you look at the overall positivity rate and case rate, the same thing has happened over the last three or four weeks where it's leveled off in that high transmission area. To give you a comparison, uh, last July, I think we were in the ballpark of around 73 to 75 uh, when we made our presentation on July 12th. Next slide. Similar, our, our uh, district data, uh, 34 positive cases this past week, 704 quarantines. And I would say it's been very similar, again, where we've seen that level off over the last three or four weeks and have stayed in the same ballpark. Uh, with, I mean, a little uh, discrepancies, but for the most part, it's been pretty consistent over the last three or four weeks. Next slide. This is encouraging uh, trend data. When you look at October, November, and December, uh, when you look at from an operational standpoint, our uh, subfill rates have been very strong and stayed in that ballpark of 86% uh, with certified and roughly about 76% overall. Next slide. And these are all the factors that we're watching closely. I'm not gonna go through them all, but one uh, that I'd like to point out is the availability of the vaccine for five and older. Uh, one thing that we've done over the past month is we've hosted uh, vaccination clinics in our elementary schools, and I believe 12 different sites. And out of that, we've seen over 500 students access that. So that's very positive. So with that, I'll stand for questions. Any questions for Trustee Walker? I mean, not Trustee Walker, not yet anyway. <laughs> Dr Trustee Director Walker. Walker. Wow. <laughs> Trustee Schmidt. Thanks, President Wagers. Um, Director Walker, I've seen uh, a couple of references to the availability of vaccine for children five through 11. You mentioned it again in your update. Is one of the factors also to measure the 
actual vaccinated rate? Is there a way that we can even legally get that data? I mean, it seems like that's a critical part of our decision-making process or should be. Yeah, President Wagers, uh, Trustee Schmidt. Currently, uh, we are not collecting that information from our students. Uh, we have informally got that from our staff. They have the opportunity to submit their vaccination cards to be on file with the district, uh, but they are not required to do so at this time. Do we have the availability to get uh, information from the maybe just bulk data, not specific like down to a child's name, but from the 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 places where the vaccines are being administered, or is there is there some way to get some of that data? I guess. President Wagers, Trustee Schmidt, I am going to let uh, Administrator Fredrickson answer that question because she's been in contact with. Um, Central District Health, she sits in on those meetings and also with Primary Health. President Wagers, Trustee Schmidt, that is a great question and I think one that we would love to get some more data on. When I reached out to Central District Health, they pointed us to the tabloid that the statewide data that was referenced by Mr. Haworth earlier. Um, we know numbers when St. Luke's and Albertsons have came out to our schools to do the vaccination clinics. We know numbers that have participated per site, but we don't know where those children attend school or how, what that percentage means to each school site. And certainly we don't have the data around how many are accessing vaccine through their pediatrician or other healthcare provider. Are you ready? Do you have further questions for Dr. Walker or would you like Any further, to proceed? Any further questions for Dr. Trustee? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to make up all kinds of titles for him tonight. Thank you, Director Walker. <laughs> Administrator Fredrickson. Okay. Next slide, please. An additional mitigation strategy that we are currently researching and looking at developing would be a test to stay program. Test to stay is exactly what it sounds like. It's COVID-19 testing that allows individuals to be in schools more. It's being used around the country in several districts and states such as Utah, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. Benefits to the test to stay program are that it minimizes quarantine time. It increases or saves in-person instructional days, and it provides testing options available to all families. So there's not a barrier for families to access testing. Um, next slide, please. There's actually two prongs to the test to stay program. One is for symptomatic individuals, and that we really are currently implementing already. And that is when a person is sick with what could be COVID-19 symptoms, as long as their symptoms improve and they receive a negative COVID-19 test, they can come back to school as soon as those two criteria have been met. The second prong is for individuals who have been exposed to someone with COVID-19, but don't have any symptoms themselves. And what the test to stay program would do in this case is you, you would take that person through days of testing or serial testing while they still are allowed to come to school. During that time, they would also mask. And as long as they complete a number, and it, it varies by the test to stay program, but as long as they complete that number, such as five days of testing and remain asymptomatic, then they're cleared um, and continue to come to school. Certainly, if individuals in the school setting are masked, um, and the exposure happens in the school setting, if both individuals are masked, then we fall under the CDC's mask exception for instructional settings. And so that allows someone to stay in school as well if they've been exposed. Or if they're vaccinated and asymptomatic, they can continue to come to school. Um, it is recommended that those individuals get tested three to five days after the exposure. Um, but they can continue to come to school as long as they're asymptomatic. 
And just to remind everyone, the recommended quarantine that's recommended by public health officials, the timeline for that is 14 days. A shortened version of that would be 10 days. And if a person is willing to get a test on day five to seven, then they could return on day eight. So you can see where a test to stay program could really have a significant impact on saving instructional, in-person instructional days. Next slide. Currently we are partnering with Boise State and Keele Medical um, who is housed in the Grace Jordan Community Center to offer free PCR and rapid antigen testing to any students or staff of the district. And we're doing that through accessing the governor's funding for COVID-19 testing. Students and staff also have access to free in-home PCR testing through the vault testing program and that they can get those tests at any school site. We get them through, through Central District Health and the Department of Health and Welfare. So again, no charge to the students or staff and they get the results in about two to three days. We are also on a wait list for rapid antigen tests um, with the Department of Health and Welfare and hope to have some supply of those soon that we could potentially have in our schools for families and staff. And we are also researching the supply of rapid antigen tests that's available through retailers. Um, quite honestly, with the test to stay program, the supply chain, as well as the potential man hours, manpower um, needed to implement such a program through the logistics of actual testing to the tracking of the serial testing are concerns that we know that we need to research further before we develop a program that we feel might be a fit for the district. Any questions around test to stay? Yeah, I'll start out. Um, so, because this, this is an important prompt. I mean, I think we can reduce quarantining, we can, you know, have kids back in school. I, I think it's, you know, a, a huge deal, but it's, if I calculate right, you know, you got about 700 kids in quarantine. So 700 times five, 3,500 tests a week. And that's just for the group. Now, if we went off masking, all of a sudden you've got an, another exponent to add to that as well, because all these folks would be exposed because they wouldn't be wearing masks. And so there would be more quarantine. Is that, am I talking about that correctly? President Wagers, you're exactly right in the fact that the, if we don't have universal masking, anyone with, that's not wearing a mask in the instructional setting would no longer qualify for that mask exception. And so would possibly need to quarantine if they're not vaccinated vaccinated okay. or if they don't want to participate in the test to stay program. Right. And, but if we run to our vaccination standard, I mean, if we look what was on the website, we're at 12% for five through 11, you know, 39 for 15 through 12 and 44 through 15 through 17. So it's, it's a lot, you know, it, it would be, it would be a lot of folks. Um, so the question is, and this is the, the unknown question is when could we have that in place? I mean, is there, is there a hope? Is there a time frame? Is there a goal? Um, where we think we could possibly do it. And I know that may be an unanswerable question, but I'd, I'd like you to give a shot. Sure. President Wagers, members of the board, we have been researching this over the last few weeks, um, gosh, even probably prior to the Thanksgiving break. And we, there are a lot of states and other districts that have implemented this. So we're hopeful that we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, there are actually organizations out there that will assist districts with it as well. So we're researching a lot of options at this at this time, and we hope to have more information early into the second semester of what might be a, the best fit for the Boise School District. Okay, thank you. Um, Trustee Oppenheimer, did you have one? Thank you. Um, can you refresh my memory? So the partnership with BSU and then Keele Medical, I believe, um, if a student has symptoms or has been exposed and if they go get a rapid test at one of those and it is negative, 
are they allowed to, they don't have to quarantine anymore or can you help me understand what that is? I don't remember. President Wagers, Trustee Oppenheimer, um, public health officials will, will tell us, and if you look at the decision trees that were published by Central District Health, if a person is exposed to COVID-19 but doesn't have any symptoms, they need a PCR, a negative PCR test in order to return to school. If a person is symptomatic or has been symptomatic, um, they can have a negative rapid antigen test and return to school. So that's why both of those tests are available through Boise State University and Keel Medical. Um, again, no charge to any of the students or the staff of the district. Other questions from trustees for Administrator Fredrickson? Nope. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide. Okay, so um, our administrative recommendation is at this time to stay the course with current protocols and revisit the mask mandate in mid-February. Um, as you can probably tell, given the hesitancy of our medical professionals concerning Omicron, the current community health indicators, their concerns for the winter holidays, that was a piece of this puzzle. Um, and then the other piece of the puzzle would be, we do really wanna explore and look at implementing um, a more robust voluntary test to stay program. Um, I think we feel that the rapid antigen testing in the schools for symptomatic students is pretty doable, but as um, President Wagers, you kind of looked at, some of the known exposures for, for asymptomatic students, we need to get a better plan in place for that. Um, so if we wanna scale up, that's something that um, would be helpful for us to have a little more time on. So next slide. So what that leads us to next steps. We obviously need to continue to monitor the data and adjust as needed. Um, we also would like to continue to develop that test to stay option as outlined in the presentation, that's of course voluntary. We wanna to continue to offer vaccination clinics in the district as needed so that families who choose to vaccinate their children have that opportunity. Um, and then the biggest piece of this puzzle that I think is gonna be important moving forward for the long game is we need to really start moving from a pandemic plan to an endemic plan. We need to learn how to live with this. Um, and so that's something we'd really like to work with stakeholders to start developing um, so that we can move forward and be flexible and fluid and um, respect the interests that we've developed. So those are our next steps and our recommendations. And I think I'm turning it over to Deputy Superintendent Rod Roberts. Any questions? Trustee Haas. Uh, my qu question is, uh, the thought is to revisit it in February. Would that be in the form of a, another recommendation to be considered? President Wagers, Trustee Haas, I think it, I think it could be. I think we would be, have a chance. We will have come back from that holiday break, had a you know several weeks, hopefully about three to four weeks, where we could look at the numbers and see if there has been a spike come from the holidays. We would know more in our community what the Omicron variant looks like. Um, you know, I don't know that our medical professionals are ever going to say, gosh, we can um, get behind you on optional masking just because of CDC guidelines, but to come in and to um, talk about that with you. Um, so I do think that we would have a chance to, to come to you again and offer another um, recommendation at that point. Follow up, can I follow up? Sure, go ahead, Trustee. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, uh, for what it's worth, I think it would be helpful to have it in the form of a recommendation. So the public can have a, an opportunity to weigh in um, and provide input. Um, I know there's a little confusion on what happened. You know, there was a comment on the, you know, I reviewed testimony based on what the doctors were saying and based on the proposed plan. So anything that we can do to make sure that we could have full um, comment by the, our constituents. Um, I think that could be in the form of a recommendation in February or whatever. Mm -hmm time you think is appropriate. That's, that's my- President Wagers, Trustee Haas, I can assure you that we would have never um, 
recorded a meeting for all of our staff. Had we thought that we were going to be changing the presentation for tonight, we were just as surprised as everyone come last night. And, and not a criticism, I'm just saying an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, oh, I, I completely understand. I, I we, we felt very bad about the fact that our recommendation was changing. Trustee Greeley. Uh, thank you, President Wagers. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Roberts, can I just ask for clarification when you said, um, when Director Anderson was saying that you would, we would revisit this in February, is that when you're planning to kind of come with an, the endemic plan? President Wagers, Trustee Greeley, that would be our hope. Okay. Absolutely. Thank because you. it is exactly like she said, we have to learn to live with this um, and, and get our schools, you know, as to where it, it isn't. Um, so consuming every day in their operations. Any other trustee comments or questions? Um, I'll just, I'm frustrated. I know all these people are frustrated. I, I know our staff is frustrated. I know our students are frustrated. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that. I mean, we have got lots of input from both sides. Um, and we do read it. I mean, it's back to, I, and I know there's lots of comments that, oh, you're not paying attention. And you can shake your head or no. Okay, just because, okay, we're not having a commentary. This is, this is the board. Um, so, but we do pay attention and it is heart-wrenching from both sides. Um, and I'd, I'd like to appreciate the work the administration has done to pivot on this as they felt they needed to. And that's there, you know, and we have to decide as a board what will happen. But, They've done an amazing amount of work in, you know, trying to present one and then trying to present another one over the course of, you know, short amount of time. Um, but, I, you know, it's hard when you're getting differing advices and you have to change those things. So, but I'd like to just acknowledge the fact that the, I mean, I as a board member, and I don't speak for the whole board, but understand that there is no perfect answer. Um, and we will Either way, anyway, anything we do, we will make half the people mad. And, but we will still, I still will make the decision that I feel like needs to be made for myself. And I feel strongly that every person on this board will do that same thing. Any other, um, uh, Trustee Langley? I just like to um, echo that frustration. Um, looking at the numbers today that, that the administration presented from the district, it's very clear that within the district, we are far from where we were at the beginning of the year when we were heavily considering not masking before the Delta variant came along. As a matter of fact, we, we had really solid numbers that looked like we didn't have to mask. And I was truly very excited about that. Um, I was very excited about the recommendations from these um, medical professionals as well. But it seems to me that um, it's very evident by data that our numbers are not what they should be. Um, it still were in the red category. And the thing that I was counting on to make that um, leap from where we were before and didn't have to mask to where we are now with higher numbers and not having to mask was vaccines. But our vaccination rate is extremely low. So that's very disappointing. And I could see how we could clearly go forward ahead from all the testimony tonight if we had higher vaccination rates. If we could move out of masking much faster with higher community vaccination rates. So I, I, I'm disappointed that we don't have, we can't, uh, we have to do something for our community protection. Uh, so I just like to put that out there that I'm very grateful for all of the uh, information that we learned about today. And I'm also frustrated. Trustee Greeley. Uh, thank you, President Wagers. Um, I very much appreciate, well, first of all, one thing I'm really concerned and looking, interested in seeing the impact of the Omicron, Omicron um, variant, as well as one of the big concerns to me is the um, holiday winter surge. I mean, I think back to in August, I mean, we were looking, things were looking good in the summer and it was after 4th of July gatherings and we started to see increases. We started to see it after Thanksgiving. So um, I am really wanting to see the data coming in a few weeks to see what's happening. 
um, very much appreciate that you are um, working on implementing as much as you can for a test to stay, um, as well as the endemic plan. So I appreciate the work that's going into that. Trustee Gregory. Thank you, President Wagers. Um, the thing that has keep, kept coming back to my mind during the past uh, several days and reading uh, the public input and then today looking through all the comments that were attached uh, that came in as a result of the agenda. Um, I, I go back to our, our first interest, which is to maintain five-day in-person learning. And um, I feel that um, the risk of holiday gatherings and Omicron present a threat to that. Having, um, and it, it feels to me like staying the course and then making adjustments is a better option than making adjustments and having to readjust too quickly, which could be because, I mean, what happened in July pivoted in a matter of days and we found ourselves reversing ourselves. We, if we make a decision tonight, it won't be implemented until a, from a, approximately a month from now, which is three to four weeks for things to change dramatically and have to pivot again. And if one thing we've heard from our families, it's, it's steadiness. And even if it's steadiness, not in the way that they want to choose, that, that they would have chosen, it's known. And we still say that we are going to give ourselves an opportunity to examine data, which we will be doing in the next month. Um, we have an opportunity to be flexible after that. So um, I guess just for the purpose of discussion, President, may I put a motion on the floor? Or is it, do we want to continue with you, your discussion? You may always put a motion on the floor. <laughs> um, after, a lot, a lot of consideration and study and listening tonight. I would um, move that we approve the motion, the um, recommendation brought forward by the administration to um, proceed with our known protocol at this point and reevaluate um, by mid February. Um, so I may want one clarification from the administration on that. I, and it, it can be from the superintendent, it's fine. Um, do you feel like that is? Are we staying the course at this point, or is there a motion needed to change that course? Um, President Wagers and, and trustees, I, I don't believe that a motion is necessary um, if, if we are not changing our current practice. Um, now, the I mean, the board obviously can make a motion and, and determine that, but I'm not sure that there is one that is needed um, because you're, you're not changing anything. Had we decided to change that, I think that motion would be appropriate at that point. Okay. Hearing that, would you like to? In uh, in that regard, I withdraw my motion. Okay. Any other motions from the board? Any other? Or we, we can still have some comments as well. Um, if there's no action, there's we don't have to take it. We don't have to vacate. We, action item gives give us the option to take option action. We do not have to take action. Trustee Schmidt. I just. Uh, I guess I wanted to echo some of the comments, but add my own perspective. Um, I've been thinking about this agenda item and I, I've reached out to friends um, in the area, outside of the area, parents, vice principals, principals, directors, physicians. Um, and as thinking about all of these, these different options or, or, or I guess getting those different perspectives, that goes in addition to revealing the comments that came in and the emails. I'm aware of over 200 notes, individual notes that came in from the public. And the interesting thing about this is, is that every one of those comments is from somebody who cares about their child. And the first one that you'll read says, I'm a parent of a child at this school. I love my child get rid of these masks. And the next comment that you read says, I'm a parent and my child's at this school, you must keep these masks in place. 
And it goes like that, back and forth. Everybody's passionate. When I talked with uh, some, I mean, some of the, the perspectives are the board's taking freedoms away from individuals by requiring masks. The board is dictating how my child should be parented by requiring masks. Wearing masks causes skin reactions and it's making my child refuse to go to school. Not wearing masks is gambling with the lives and the livelihood of children and those around them. Wearing masks uh, has enabled my child to stay in school even because they had close contact with others. And it's, I mean, it's on both sides. So after talking with all these individuals, what this shows me is there is no one right answer for every child in the district because the answer that's right for my child is actually harmful for someone else's child. So I think it's, it's an incredibly difficult decision that we have to make uh, because like you said, half of the constituents are going to be disappointed because it's the wrong decision for their family or their child. As I look at this, my particular judgment, my particular decision on this issue really is, is trying to look at what is, what is best for the whole district, not for any one particular interest or any one particular child, including my own children in the schools. And uh, so I just wanted to, I guess, say publicly that, um, the public may have the perception that, that we're not reading these things and that we don't care. I can speak for myself to say that I did care and I did read them. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, a difficult choice. Uh, there's an often cited study from 2009 uh, of uh, hospital staff where they, some chose to wear masks or somewhere they were in the study, some wore masks and some didn't. And they looked at the infection rate of, uh, in that population. And the study says that the, there was no statistical difference between the mask wearers and the non-mask wearers. And when I was talking to a physician friend of mine, he cited that saying, look, masks don't help protect you. But as he was telling me, when I go into surgery, I wear a mask because I'm trying to keep my spit literally from going and getting in this patient who we're working on. And so in his, in his conversation with me, he was trying to tell me, don't worry about masks, they don't matter. But he's also telling me as a part of my profession, I know masks work because we all wear them in the operating room. So my personal opinion is that given the infection rate that we've got, the statistics that we saw today, and the fact that at some level, if everybody is wearing a mask, it is protecting the whole. I have to believe that, uh, that we shouldn't be changing our course today. Thank you, Trustee Schmidt. Trustee Oppenheimer. Thank you, President Wagers. I, you know, I, I thank you for that, Trustee Schmidt. Um, you know, I, I think that the data speaks for itself. And, um, and I've said it before, none of us want to wear masks, right? But we do. Um, and I'm so proud that we have been a district in the state that has been able to be in person five days a week. And I honestly believe it is because of the courses that we have taken to keep, to have our kids masked and our teachers masked in schools. I have to believe that. Because when I look at other districts that did not have that, they were having to close on a dime and that's not something that we want to do. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, we're not out of the woods. Um, just because our hospitals came out of crisis standards of care does not mean that it's good, guys. Like it's still, that was extreme. We are still in the red. We are, st there's still high transmission. We want to keep our kids safe. I don't want to see kids in the hospital. I don't want to see kids that, you know, um, that are taking something home to grandma and grandpa at the holidays. And I just think that it's the safe thing to do to, to stay our course. We'll revisit this. We've had to pivot before. Um, we will continue to use the data and the information that we have in front of us. Um, and we do read every single email. And literally today, 
One was right after the other, four against, four against, four against. Um, and so th this is tough, right? Um, we, like I said, we don't want to wear a mask, but I, I honestly believe in my heart of hearts, listening to the data, listening to the medical professionals um, and, and seeing the proof that we have been able to stay in school five days a week, which is what we want. Um, I do not want to shut our schools down again because we don't have enough teachers because there are too many kids that are out. I want our kids, kids in school. Um, and if we have to continue to wear masks for a little while longer or whatever that looks like in the next month or two, um, I support that 100%. Any other trustee comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Um, other business, we have some policy revisions. I think Director Anderson, or is it trustee or, no, it's still director. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with that, that's good. Um, so we have uh, two policies that are up for first read. Um, policy 3232 and policy 3232R. Um, if you had an, op hop had an opportunity to actually look at these policies, you'll notice there's like a gigantic chunk of green new text and then a lot of red. Um, so just the short, short uh, story of that is that um, federal guidance has changed and we need to keep our policies in alignment with what the expectations are from the federal government. Um, so this is not necessarily a change in how we do business necessarily, but it does need to um, align with what the expectations are from the federal government. So what I'd recommend is that you take a look at that because it's a lot, um, read through it, and then you can ask myself or anyone else that's on the governance committee, um, Mr. Skinner, um, myself, or any of the trustees, and we can give you some insight into that um, before it comes to you for a second read. President Wagers. Uh, Superintendent Dennis. Yeah, and, and just to kind of dovetail on what uh, Becca's saying, um, you know, and just for the new trustees, whenever we do a first read, um, it's an opportunity for the board to weigh in. Um, if, you, uh, if you have suggestions, let us know. We can take that back to the committee and then before we bring it back for a second read and then approval. So I just wanted to make sure the, the board all understood that this is your opportunity to give input into this before the administration brings it back with a second reading recommendation. Thank you. Any, qu any questions for Director Anderson at this point? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we'll move on to board trustee superintendent comments. Any comments from anybody tonight? Trustee Langley. I'd just like to thank the, um, uh, the parents who regularly um, communicate with us about their opinions and their, um, their thoughtful approaches for their families and thank the physicians who um, have taken a lot of risk in their personal careers to give us advice over time and um, our administration for the thoughtful way that they've approached this over a, lo a long term approach that we did not see would be as long as it is. And of course, our, our educators for implementing every single day this hard mm -hmm. um, process. I, I'm just re astounded by this meeting. Again, the level of the amount of people that it takes to make this decision and come to the table or to even say that we can't make this decision now. Any other comments from trustees or superintendency? Um, just a reminder that we have our um, legislative uh, luncheon. Um, I believe it is Thursday. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Wednesday. Wednesday. Um, and just to remind the board that we'll be meeting with our legislators to talk about legislative priorities for this year. Um, we had a, a region three legislative meeting over in Caldwell last week. Um, and some of those same uh, legislators heard the region three um, priorities, which mirror very similar to ours. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that was coming. Thank you. Trustee Haas. Uh, just as a quick update, um, we had um, 
we know we had a student who uh, submitted an application to be a trustee. And uh, so I had a conversation with her about, um, you know, about some of the uh, motivations of being a trustee or wanting to be a trustee. And, and the bottom line is uh, that uh, from her perspective and other students' perspective, that there's a, there's a need to have greater access from students to the board. And so um, we've been working with this on the communications committee. We talked about it at uh, last time we met um, at our workshop. So just want to report that what we're going to do is we're going to go out and look at other way, other ways or what districts are doing in terms of structure and providing student input uh, for the board. So we'll be that commit our committee will be working on that. And we'll re we'll report as we move forward. So I just want to report on that. Great, thank thank you for doing that. And, thank oh, you. and I just wanted to add. I uh, sorry about that. Um, and in the course of doing this, there's a lot of things that we actually already do as far as student involvement with the board. And there's a big long list. And for the interest of time, I won't go, you know, through that. But as a district, we're constantly looking at ways to do things better and how can we improve. And so um, even though uh, I'm totally satisfied that there's great opportunity for students to be involved uh, with the board or the administration, uh, we're going to see if we can do even better. So thanks. Yeah, thank you for emphasizing that, Trustee Oz. I appreciate that. Trustee Gregory? Thank you, President Wagers. Um, also, this Thursday will be the first of a, of a new series of webinars coming from ISBA, and I will send that information to Sharon, and she can send it out. It's at uh, 1, 1 o'clock p.m., and um, it's just an hour, and it's um, just focused on a topic uh, to help a kind of professional development for trustees and this is their first beginnings and um, I'll send you a link. Great, thank you. Anything else? Well, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to all. I think this is, you know, we'll have, we'll have an opportunity to meet, um, but uh, school, school will go on for a little bit and then it'll have a nice little break and maybe the trustees will have a little break too, maybe, maybe not. Um, but and I would entertain a motion. President Wagers, move to adjourn. And second. Second by Trustee Haas. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>